Here in Shropshire is a farm that's frozen in time, lost in Victorian rural England. Now a unique project has brought it back to life, as it would have been in the 1880s. Gee up! For a full calendar year, Ruth Goodman, Alex Langlands and Peter Ginn are reliving the life of the Victorian farmer. <laughs> Eight months into the project, they've restored the derelict farmyard under the watchful eye of their landlord, Mr Acton. What do you think of the stone, Mr Acton? I think it's slightly tilted. <laughs> <laughs> Pull that leg out. They've delivered lambs. Here we go. Go, 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 go. Get him out, get him out, get him out. And piglets. This one really doesn't look good. Look at the size difference there. Cared for a pregnant cow through the winter. There we go. That's it. And learn to handle a shire horse. How am I doing then? You're doing very well. Only to see him go lame. It's a bit of a nightmare, really, because we need him to be in shape. Now it's summer on the Victorian farm. <laughs> it's May. Summer means time to bring in the hay harvest. If you get it right, you've got a hayloft full of hay for your cows, your sheep and your horses. If you get it wrong, it could spell disaster for the farm. It's hard going in the dairy. This is women's work. Doesn't make it any easier. And with the sheep. You just start to eat little holes into the skin. Alex takes up a risky new venture. How long is it going to be before I get stung? Long days mean more time for leisure as the team explore what Victorian farmers did for fun. This is the most fantastic train. But as the weather turns, it becomes a race against time to save the hay from ruin. Get up! Get up! May is a crucial month for the farm's flock of Shropshire sheep, a popular Victorian breed. Having given birth to 16 lambs, the 10 sheep must now be shorn. Alex and Peter have asked sheep farmer Richard Spencer and professional shearer Keith Sessions to help out. The first objective here is to get the sheep from the covered area where they've been sheltering from the rain overnight and into the yard. Come, Junior, come. We don't. 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 Push them on in then now. Come here. Come here. Come here. All the gates are shut in this yard, aren't they, Peter? I believe so. The sheep are getting out. Where are they getting out? Go the road. road. Oh dear. The sheep have smashed their way through a weak spot in the fence. They're all the way up there. Last time we lost one sheep when we uh, attempted to move them. We've now succeeded in losing all 26. Four of the ewes are quickly found, but convincing them to return to the yard isn't going to be easy. They're coming. Alex and Richard have managed to track down the rest of the flock. I've just been told to get out of the road because they're pushing them up the lane. And it's gone 12 now. And we've not even, well, we've not even got the sheep in the farmyard. We're going backwards rather than forwards at the moment. <laughs> nothing, nothing seems to ever go to plan. Forget me not. Over you go. <laughs> the farm's cow, forget me not, 
has given birth to her calf. Ruth's getting to grips with a daily milking routine. She's a nice, quiet cow. Makes a big difference, doesn't it, girl? You're a good cow, aren't you? Hey, what a good girl. Cow needs to build a relationship with you. Certainly talking to them helps, because your voice is soothing and they know who you are, your smell, your voice, what you look like. I have been looking forward to this. Milking and dairying are such an important part of small farms in this part of the world. Where is an arable farm in the 1870s? Needed about 50 acres of land to break even. A small Shropshire dairy farm could manage with only five acres. You could pay your rent with the cheese money. So I'm going to watch forget me nots milk day by day, and when I see it change from this lovely, lovely, rich, thick milk into something thinner, then that'll be the time to go into massive cheese production. The sheep have finally been rounded up. They're just coming around the corner now. Thank you very much. Ah, oh, there you are. If there's anything good to come out of that, Alex, the sheep will be hot and sweaty, as well as me. Right. And it means that the, the wool will have risen, as we call it. It means, basically, that the oils and greases that are naturally there in the fleece, yeah. they'll be hot and it'll make shearing that much easier. The fleece will tend to peel off rather than have to be, you know, right. peeled off with a lot of effort. Right, so... It'll come off easily. So letting them break out of the stack yard and run a couple of miles was, was actually good for them. It wasn't good for me, but it was good for the sheep, yeah. <laughs> In the farmyard, it's time to get to work. In the early 19th century, sheep were sheared with clippers, but by the 1870s, Shearing machines were being developed. Right, are you ready to start? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the speed of that then compared to the hand shears. The machines were much more efficient, but had one real drawback for the person winding them. <laughs> it's, all right, it's hard to concentrate. Bloody mackering! <laughs> there we are, done. Yes, he's done. One down, nine to go. As Keith's son takes over the winding, Peter brings out a time saving device invented by the team's landlord, Mr. Acton. Aha! Mr Acton got tired of having people hand cranking with his old machines, so he rigged up the mechanism onto this 1950s rally treader. I like the footwork, Alex. This time, it's Alex's turn to shear. Give me some power then, Peter. There's a lot of vibrations coming up from the seat. It's a bit of a fun ride. So much easier than the hand crank. Wish you'd hurry up, though. A professional can shear a sheep in two minutes. Alex has been working at this one for 20. There is a possibility the sheep may die of old age, but we'll hope not. That was difficult. That was really difficult. You just... You don't know where body stops and fleece starts. Oh, no the shearing has revealed a serious problem. The fleece is infested with maggots. If they're left long enough, they then start to eat little holes into the skin. Christ, yeah. yes. And then they get under the skin. Mm. And if they get them bad enough, you move the skin and they all come out the holes that are there in the back of the sheep. I mean, a few more days, it would be a lot worse. So we've got it just in time. 
so from now on in, what do we need to do? Because the fleece has gone off the ewes, it should be all right with the ewes. Yeah. As the lambs get older and it gets to the middle of the summer, yeah. then they could become more of a problem. We've got to really keep our eyes yeah. peeled then. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> That's what we want. Oh, oh, go it. To a successful sheep shearing afternoon. Successful yeah, sheep, sheep shearing afternoon. Tommy. <laughs> 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 The hay harvest is the biggest job of early summer. The team will be using the meadow in front of Mr Acton's hall. I'm just having a closer look at some of the species we've got in here. We've got a lovely meadow grass there. There's some perennial rye grass or a lovely foxtail. And these all make for great fodder crops. Essentially haymaking is coming out here and cutting the grass, the point at which it flowers, when it's at its maturest, if you like, and it's at its sweetest as well. You let it dry in the field, we'll then rake it all up, we'll get it on our dray, get it back into the farmyard, up into the hayloft, and it's essentially a crop, it's a harvest, because that hay will sustain our cattle and our horses and our sheep throughout the long winter months. In the early 19th century, huge teams of people brought in the hay entirely by hand. But by the 1880s, the harvest was becoming mechanised. I hope you don't mind me roping you into this one, Peter. No, not at all. But I think this is a two-man job. For advice on the latest technology, Alex has consulted the team's Bible for the year, the Book of the Farm, published in 1888. The boys are keen to use as much up-to-date kit as possible, if they can get it working. So this is a hay rake. Look, there's a little bit of movement there. Yeah. But it's obviously been here for quite a while. This is just another one of these fantastic machines that Mr Acton's collected up. He's, he's got around. a lot, hasn't he? It is. It's amazing. And it's horse-drawn as well, so it should save us a lot of time. Yes, yes, it should. But, of course, we've got to get it out first. <laughs> so let's start hacking away at some of these brambles and... I see you've got your pasty on. I have. I've got one. I've got the right, you've got the left. I've got the bill hook. No, I've got the right, you've got the left. Yes, just <laughs> testing there, just testing. <laughs> It's always good to have, good to have my beast of burden with me. I like to get Peter to do the lifting and the pulling and the... You enjoy it though, don't you, Peter? And see so you sitting on there. Is it quite light? Yeah. That's, that's actually one of the lightest vehicles we've got. I should imagine the weight's going to be when, yeah, when you drop it. So you, so you sit up, so if I sit up there, Take the pasties. Do I sit up here? Mind right. yourself on that. That looks quite vicious. It does, doesn't it? It's quite pronounced there at the front. It's a bit damp, actually. Um, OK, so you be the horse. Yes. You ready? I'll be the haymaster. Right. Whoa. Right. So beautiful Victorian engineering at its best. So we're going along. I pull this lever and it I can't. It's, does it push forward? Yeah. Try pushing it all the way forward. Oh, I can't. I can't. It's, I can't. It's seized, I think. Try undoing the um, uh, wing nut. Ah. Right, that's the problem then. Slide that. Yeah. And bang, there goes the rake. And it's in. So I'm dragging the rake along the ground. Hay's catching in it. I collect all the hay up. It's getting really heavy. It's got full. I get in line with my windrow and I lift the rake, drop the hay. And we turn around. Drop the rake again. Yeah. Brilliant. Whoa! Stand boy, stand boy. Good boy. Before the hard work of the harvest begins, Peter's making good use of his remaining free time. I think it's undisputable that summer has finally arrived on the farm, so we've been thinking cricket match. But for a cricket match, we're going to need a cricket bat, and I've dug out this uh, catalogue of H.J. Gray & Sons. They're a Victorian company that are still operating and making cricket bats today. Cricket bat making is quite an important rural craft. However, I... I'm pretty ignorant of how a cricket bat's made. So I'm going to go to the factory, I'm going to find out. H.J. Gray & Sons is now the famous company Gray Nichols, who 
whose bats are used all over the world. The laws of cricket state that bats must be made from wood, and for hundreds of years, English willow has been a popular choice. Grey Nichols grows and processes its own. Bat maker Alex Hohenkirk is proud of the company's Victorian roots. So when's this bat from? This bat was made in 1875. Right, and you're going to try and recreate this for us? Yeah, I'll, I'll try and recreate this one today. It's a, it's a lot different from what we make now. You can see the differences in the, the general amount of wood that's in the bat uh, all, to, all through it. Is this machine made? or? Is no, it's all, all handmade, and we do everything by sight. Right. All right, and so I shall try and replicate this bat for you. Cricket bat design was transformed in the 19th century. Before this date, bats were made of one piece of wood which meant they were easy to break and hard to repair. So bat makers came up with the idea of creating a bat in two parts by splicing together the handle and the blade. With having a splice, this gives a bat more flexibility and it gives you much more sort of strength and versatility in the shots that you're playing and you've got more, uh, more feel for the game with a bat that's been spliced. And the innovations didn't stop with the splice. The famous Victorian cricketer, W.G. Grace, developed a new style of batting, which in turn spurred changes to the shape of the bat that can still be seen today. When did the hump on the back here start being sort of really introduced? Um, the humps started to develop in around 1860, 1870. It was something um, pioneered by some of the bigger hitters of the day, players like uh, W.G. Grace. Yeah. Um, Originally, players were very into just pushing the ball around the ground, gentle, gentle shots and using the speed of the ball. Um, players like Grace tended to revolutionise things by big hitting. So the hump has been put into the bat to put more wood into the bat, which means we've got a stronger and harder striking surface. So, just one final look. The weights are pretty similar now, but I think we're pretty much there. Wonderful, thank you very much. <laughs> well, I hope it plays well for you in your cricket match and good luck with it. Back at the cottage, Ruth's indulging in her favourite summer pastime. Gardening as a leisure activity is something that becomes much more popular in the Victorian period. I'm making myself a pesticide here. Nice and simple. It's to kill the sawfly on the gooseberries. These are the leaves of the elder tree and I'm just dropping them into the bucket where there's a kettle full of hot water. I'm going to add in a few shavings of soap, bash the whole lot together, and hey presto, that's all it is. Oh, it's nice and warm. Come on, you little sore flies. Off me gooseberries. Ruth's little garden isn't the only one on the estate. Mr Acton has a spectacular walled garden. It needs constant care and he's asked the boys to help out. For Alex, it's presented a golden opportunity. There's a swarm of bees in the walled garden. This is an excellent chance for me to get uh, involved in beekeeping. It really is something that really sort of captures my imagination. For a Victorian farmer, it would be the perfect sideline. I shouldn't need gloves, but uh, I am going to take the precaution here with a bit of string, just so they don't crawl up my sleeves. But uh, I don't think I'm going to do this alone. I'm going to wait for a local beekeeping expert to come and help me wrestle this swarm and get it into our uh, Victorian cottage hive. Well, thanks ever so much for coming over, Brian. Good, pleasure. Brian Goodwin is president of the Shropshire Beekeepers Association. Yeah, it's been there, been there for a while. Ooh, good swarm. And we're going to capture these bees and we're going to put them in our cottage hive. We are, that's right. For their new home. Now, how long is it going to be before I get stung? Uh, well, you won't feel anything after about the fourth, so you'll be all right. Right, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Brian's going to catch the bees in an old-fashioned type of hive, known as a skep. They were the way to keep bees many, many years ago. I mean, this is the, the, the sort of classic, ancient way of keeping bees in Sort of reminiscent, I suppose, of Winnie the Pooh. Exactly that, yes. The bees are clustering now on this branch of a tree. Yep. And the strategy is to get them all in this basket. And the simple way of doing that is to just use a simple brush. No problem at all. 
Is anything going to upset them then doing this? Yes, you'll have 30 or 40,000 flying around your ears, but don't worry too much about that. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing to do is to shake. Right. There we are. I'm a bit worried about them calling up my... They won't jacket. hurt you. They're perfectly docile. They're an Italian type of bee. This is, this is an Italian type yes, of bee? Right. So we haven't got ourselves a good British bee no. here. So, and these were imported in the Victorian period, then? They were, these? yes. They were imported from Slovenia, uh, northern Italy, and they bred thousands and thousands of queens each year. And uh, we imported them into this country in the mistaken belief that they were better than our bees. And there they are. They're all in the skep. Skeps had many shortcomings. The swarm makes its honeycomb inside the basket. So to reach the honey, many keepers would kill their bees. Fortunately for Alex, in the 19th century, a brand new hive changed all that. There are the bees again, and I drop them onto this sloping surface, yeah. and they'll all start, start to walk uphill. Their natural tendency is always to go into a closed, dark area yeah. where they can re-establish themselves as a colony of bees. They're all doing it now. The modern beehive was created in 1851 by an American named Lorenzo Langstroth. He based his design on an amazing observation. Langstroth realised that the bees always constructed their combs with an 8mm gap. 8mm gap. This 8mm gap became known as the bee space, and replicating it was the basis of Langstroth's invention. I could lift this wooden frame, which we put into the hive, and you will see that if I move it backwards and forwards, there's just eight millimetres space. Right. The bees add the beeswax in the centre there. We can take the comb out and we can examine it quite easily. And the bees are quite happy clinging to the comb, carrying on with their work, while the beekeeper can twist the comb about and observe exactly what they're doing. Get a really good inspection going here. That's right. And so for the first time, beekeepers became not just beekeepers, but bee managers. They could influence what was going on in the hive and take certain steps to change the behaviour of the bees and to change what was happening. And that was revolutionary, and that revolutionised beekeeping. Right. Wonderful. That's fine. It's the day of the cricket match. Acton Scott, the farm's local team, are playing a neighbouring village. It'll give us a chance to try out the new bat. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, well, we've knocked it in, oiled it up, and it's ready to go. Almost looks as smart as we do. Yes. <laughs> and again! It's a nice bat, Peter. It's working beautifully. I don't claim to be a sports fan. I think I'm just here to eat the sandwiches and have a nice sit down. There's so many people. I was hoping somebody else would bring some food as well, but never mind. It'll probably all disappear in about 10 seconds flat. <laughs> I won't be here for very long. One ball. Mm. Oh, split my trousers. Go on. Middle. <laughs> 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 <Yeah. laughs> I seem to have split the incredibly tight Trousers. I got a hole in my pants as well. <laughs> oh, thank God. <laughs> I really want to be back out there batting. You do? I, yeah, I think with a better pair of trousers, right. I could have stayed in a bit longer. <laughs> Of course, earlier on in the 19th century, we'd probably be doing blood sports, the bare fist fighting, the cock fighting, all that kind of thing. But uh, towards the end of the 19th century, landlords were looking to, uh, to get their labourers and, and the people of the parish involved in far gentler sports. So cricket was a perfect opportunity to sort of galvanise the community. Far more gentlemanly pursuits for the labouring classes. As June begins, preparations for the hay harvest are in full swing. This is our mower. How does it work, then? Hay comes in here. Yeah. We're missing a blade. Yes, it's not in brilliant shape, is it? The sheep are enjoying their shorter fleeces. 
forget-me-not in her car for doing well. And for a couple of weeks, the bees have been left to their own devices. It's about time that I got into the hive and had a check to see how things are getting on. And look at that. That is absolutely wonderful. They are making inroads. And in fact, looking at it, I, I think I should be concerned because the danger here is that what they'll do is they'll fill this up and they'll say, right, we've run out of space. We need to swarm. We need to, um, we need to find somewhere else to go. And that's the last thing I want. To swarm and make a new colony, bees must first create a new queen. So I think the most crucial thing for me to do here is to check that they're not developing any queen cells. Let's have a look. You can see all the larvae in there and bingo. Now this is just what we don't want. This thing here is a queen cell. I think, to be honest, I've got it just in the nick of time. My job really here is to just pinch this out. That wasn't far off becoming a queen. So what I'm going to do is put another box on with some more frames in, some empty frames in. This is going to go back on. Hmm. Just a minute, chaps. I've just got to be on the meat and two veg. want them getting in there. So, I think I've taken the necessary steps to avoid swarming. So, let's get the lid on. And it clearly won't be long now before we start to extract some honey. Piglets have got big, and it's high time they were weaned from their mother. At the moment, their pure source of food is princess's milk. So we need to wean them, which is a gradual process. There's a picture of a ring pig's trough in Book of the Farm. And we've got a very similar design pig trough. And basically, it, it creates segments. So when the piglets feed, they've each got their own little compartment which I suppose mirrors the fact that they each have their own teat that they will take milk from Princess from. But I'm going to try and let the pigs out without letting Princess out, which is going to be easier said than done. <laughs> done it the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll feed her here. Go anywhere for food. It appears on the surface of things to be moderately successful. Rearing these guys has been a lot of work, but it's been such a fun time, and I'm immensely proud, certainly of the ones that are feeding from the feeder, not so much of the ones with the heads in the bucket, but it's been great. Out of all the animals on the farm, I think the pigs are the ones I'm going to miss the most. It's going to be quite a wrench, actually. And once they're fully weaned, some of you'll keep and some you'll kill. Shh, don't tell them. It's harsh. <laughs> it's harsh. I've got a really messy, stinky job here. I've got the stomach of a young calf, a male calf, from our neighbours over there. And I've got to clean it out and make rennet, which is the magic ingredient that turns milk into cheese. 
Obviously, in a dairy herd, male calves are not terribly useful. So at this time of year, many of the male calves are slaughtered. You eat the veal, of course, which is very tasty, and use the stomachs to make your cheese. A calf's stomach has four chambers. Ruth must find the fourth one, where rennet is produced. Rennet is the juices of the stomach. It's the enzymes with which the young mammal, and it happens in any mammal, including ourselves, separate their mother's milk into a solid and a liquid. Cheese making is very dependent upon this rennet. Milk has to be separated into curds and whey. Ruth must rinse out the stomach and cover it with salt to preserve it. The calf has to be very young. It has to be one that has only sucked milk and has not yet been weaned onto grass. Once the calf has been weaned and is eating solid foods, the, the nature of the enzymes changes in the stomach and no longer does the job with the same efficiency. The stomach will now be left in a bucket of water. The rennet will seep out, ready for use in a few weeks' time. The hay field is growing well, but preparations for the harvest have hit a snag. Clumper, the farm's shire horse, has an ongoing problem with his hoof. Since most of the machinery is horse-drawn, this is a real cause for concern. No. Alex is seeking the advice of a modern vet, and as an extra measure, he's trying out a traditional homemade remedy. I'm going to make a balm here for um, Clumper's foot. It's going to be a comfrey balm. So this is a comfrey root, root the comfrey plant. Let's give it a really good breaking up. And the idea with comfrey is it's got this substance called allantoin in it. And what this stuff apparently does is it helps in cell proliferation. So the sores on his foot, hopefully I'll get the balm on there and it'll just help it heal over that much quicker. Alex must first heat the crushed root with some tallow fat. See how this is doing? It's certainly very hot. Oh, look at that, yeah. That's done the trick, I think. Just let that strain through. So that's the base oil then. What I'm going to add now is the magic ingredient. This is some beeswax from the hive. So I'm just going to put this on the range. Really, the beeswax, what it does is once it's been applied to the sore area, It'll stick, it'll hold the fat in, and the fat will be holding in the vital ingredients. Right, this looks like it's melted down. Quite a nice smell. Not that I'm sure that Clumper will appreciate that. Right, that's well mixed in. So we'll take one of these receptacles. Okay, so it's simply a case, putting this on the cold stone in the pantry to cool and set. And as soon as it's done that, I can get it on Clumper's foot. It's Alex's birthday today, so I'm going to make him a cake for tea. Birthdays were not celebrated in a big way in Victorian Britain, um, but nonetheless, there are references to farmers having cakes for their birthday. So they're making a pound cake. It basically means a pound of every ingredient. Start with butter, and then I've got some sugar, so that'll be a pound of that. And there'll be a pound weight of eggs and a pound of flour in the cake as well. A pound of raisins and currants, and then, just to flavour it, a little pinch of spice. In the walled garden, Alex's birthday is proving busy. Mr Acton has asked the boys to make a protective shelter for his raspberry patch. They've built the wooden frame, but now they've got to cover it with netting. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's to a certain extent trying to defy physics with that one, Peter. <laughs> right, when you've finished goofing around up there, Peter, we can get on some work. Wire netting became available after 1844, when Charles Barnard, an ironmonger, invented a machine to manufacture it. Barnard was a farmer's son and knew there'd be huge demand for a product that kept predators off livestock and plants. Now, do you think leave the overhang like that at the front, yeah? Yes. Yeah. What about here, though? We won't be able to open the door. Ah, I was wondering who'd be the first to spot that one. 
We could always open the door. What, and then you want to cut round it? No, you're right, let's go. Good suggestion, though, Peter. Hiya! How are you getting on? Oh, not too bad. How Very are you, well, all right? thank you. Yeah? Oh, dear, this is taking a while, isn't it? Yeah, not an easy job. Time to stop. Seeing it was your birthday, I'll bake you a cake. Mm. Oh, lovely. <laughs> He's a lucky boy. You're looking good for 45. We can't sing you happy birthday and we can't even say happy birthday. It's an American idea. It doesn't come into Britain until quite a lot later. The melody for happy birthday comes from a song called Good Morning to You, written in America in the 1890s. The famous lyric itself didn't appear in print until 1924. We have got <laughs> you something. <sighs> I wrapped it. What could it be? <laughs> the bow's just for show. Good. <laughs> Do you know what it is, The apiary, <laughs> or bees, beehives, and bee culture. <laughs> Thank you very much. There'll be no excuses now. We're expecting honey and wax in huge quantities. <laughs> so now you're a year older. Do you think you're a year wiser? Certainly when it comes to beekeeping, <laughs> I think I'm going to be. So if we can't say happy birthday to you, then, I don't know, what, um, many happy returns? Yeah. Well, Here's to another year. Congratulations <laughs> for surviving this long. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you ever so much for my book and the cake. It's lovely. <laughs> it's mid-June. Princess's piglets are now fully weaned. Hello, my sweeties. Forget-me-not is still yielding plenty of milk. Come on, you greedy. Come on. Oh, come on. And everyone's hoping the balm will make a difference to Clumper's hoof. Stand. Come on, stand still, boy. All eyes are now turning to the hayfield and the weather. For several days, the crop has been hammered by rain. At the first break in the clouds, the boys have a chance to inspect it. You feel right down in here. That's it's damp. It's damp. The earth is damp. The hay can't be harvested in wet conditions, but the boys mustn't delay for long. With every passing day, the crop's nutritional value is going down. So unless the weather improves and the harvest can start, the crop will have little use as animal feed. This is awful. Truly awful. It really is. Let's just hope we get a nice dry spell within the next couple of weeks. Right. Do you want to start getting some milk in? Yeah, sure. In the dairy, Ruth's also got a big task ahead of her. She's asked her daughter Catherine to come and help out. We're about to make our first cheese of the year, and this is our vat, uh, which is just a great big box that we're filling up with all the milk. We've got to raise it right up to, was it eight, 85, yeah, degrees. 85 degrees? 85 degrees, which is Fahrenheit, that is, Fahrenheit. Yeah. This is our method of warming the milk. This is the sort of old and traditional method of bringing the milk up to a temperature so that when we add the rennet, the magic will happen. Um, if the milk is too cold, no matter how much rennet we add, no reaction will occur and we will just have milk. If we can get the milk to the right temperature, when we pop the rennet in, the milk will then separate into the solids, which are the curds, which is what you make cheese out of, and the liquids, called whey, which you feed to the pigs. Every time the water cools in these jugs, we take the jugs out, fill them full of boiling water and pop them back in again. Once the temperature reaches 85 degrees, the rennet is added and the split into curds and whey begins. Right, so now we need to cut the curd into little cubes, um, and that starts to help the whey be released from the curds. Now, in the, in the old times, we would have done that with our hands. You'd have literally just 
put your fingers apart and gradually, very slowly, drawn your fingers through. But by Victorian times, you could purchase marvellous, gorgeous curd knives. Do you want that one? You draw it across the vat. The curd has to be treated very gently at this stage. That's it. It really smells horrible. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's horrible. <laughs> It smells like baby sick. It's really nasty. Well, it is, isn't it? It's cow baby sick. Uh, well, well, it is, isn't it? Oh, it's look, milk. It's, it's milk and the juice is from a calf's stomach. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly what, you know, if a baby calf was sick, it's still horrible. This would be it. Ruth is making cheddar cheese, and it's now that the process of cheddaring takes place. The liquid whey is drained off, heated, and returned to the vat. It then heats up the curd, which sets into a firm mass. And they should stay solid, yes, see? Yes. Yeah. Just... The curd is then piled up in blocks. By turning it, we're starting a very gentle press, just using the weight of the curd itself to press way out. If we didn't do this cheddaring process, we'd have a cheese that would only last a short while and you'd have to eat it within the month. But by doing this cheddaring process, we'll have a cheese that can last six, eight, nine months and still be nice. <laughs> Thanks for coming down again, Brian. Alex has asked beekeeper Brian Goodwin to help with one final task. Well, it, it wasn't a job I felt I could do myself, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's freshly made wax. Yeah, it is. And it's if nice. I scrape off that bit of wax with the, the hive tool, you can see oh, that yeah. there, there is honey underneath it. That's what we've come for. That's what we've come for. Mm -mm. The first step in extracting the honey is to get the bees off the comb. You can see that this comb's got rather a lot of bees on it. They're very quiet at the moment, and when I shake them off into the box, you'll find that they become rather more agitated. Mm. And this is the time that you've got to beware of them. So they don't like me doing this. So back to the cottage. Yes. Where we've got these two different types of extractor. So it'll be interesting to see how they work. Right. First, the beeswax must be removed from the comb in a process called uncapping. And it's a slicing action that gets it off right. fairly easily across the comb. And these are traditional honey knives, are they? They are. These are what are called Bingham honey knives, made in the uh, 1880s, 1890s. Then it's time to bring out the extractor. Well, you put the frame inside the extractor, resting against the wire grid, right. which supports it when it's revolving at high speed. Right, there we go. The faster you turn it, the faster the honey will be flung out by centrifugal force but against the, the metal container. But the higher the risk then of it yes. skidding off. Right, there we go, I think I've got it. The idea of using centrifugal force to extract honey was hit upon in 1865 by Italian army major Francesco de Husca. This requires quite a high level of concentration, this. Legend has it, Rushka came up with the idea after seeing his son playing with a basket of honeycomb. The boy whirled the basket in the air and his father noticed a few drops of honey come out. Have a look in there. I'll take the comb out and right. you, you can see where the honey has been flung out of the comb yep. up against the wall of the main body of the extractor. But you can see that this extractor isn't very efficient. The wonder that it's no Once the principle of using centrifugal force was established, it wasn't long before improved extractors hit the market. This was a, this was a major advance because, in fact, you can extract four combs at once in this extractor. Right. The secret is to place the extractor firmly within your knees because it could be unbalanced and you yep. need to grip it fairly tightly right. as you extract it. You turn the honey quite fast and you can see right, immediately, yeah, if you look yeah. down in the gap, you can see the honey coming out. Wow, look at that. It's amazing. When I was a lad, I used to sit in the kitchen alongside my father. Did you? He would be uncapping the combs and I would be turning the handle furiously. <laughs> Uh, and that was my job. Okay. Right, here we go, the moment here we of go. truth. Wow. And you can get that golden liquid coming out. Look at that. 
This is a dream come true, Brian. This is for me. Is it? You yeah. had to see this. Just about. And we tilt it back now, ready to close the gate valve. That's it. That's absolutely amazing. Look at that. One block at a time. Yes. Victorian technology is also coming in handy in the dairy. This curd mill was made in the factory of local inventor Thomas Corbett, whose products were sold all over the world. So having got it into these solid blocks, I think it's rather ironic that we then have to grind it down into a crumbliness. Yes, yeah, it's real weird. But I mean, the blocks helps to develop flavours, develop texture but you can't mix in the salt or pack it evenly into a press if it's in great big thunking lumps. Being a dairy implement, this is women's work. Doesn't make it any easier, does it? No. After mixing salt into the curd and packing it in a mould, it's time for the final piece of equipment, the cheese press. <sighs> this is very much a standard, basic farmyard cheese press, and you see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. They were made in vast numbers, and they survive in vast numbers because they're really sturdy and they do the job beautifully. The pressure gauge is really rather useful. Just want it so that the whey will run. There it is. Start to see the first run. Yeah. Is that running? Uh, just. Over the next three days, the pressure will be gradually increased until most of the whey has come out. It's still raining, and the hay still can't be cut. With every day that goes by, the crop is losing nutritional value. To cheer themselves up, the team are having their first taste of the farm's honey. That is absolutely stunning. It's so good. It's so alive, isn't it? Mm. Brian said there is no better tasting honey than the honey you get from your first extraction. And I think I, uh, I, think I have to agree with him. <laughs> <laughs> While they wait for the rain to stop, Peter's making some provisions. I'm going to make some ginger beer for the hay harvest. This is the family sable, Ruth's book, that she's given to me, with the best ginger beer recipe in it. It's white sugar, lemon, lemon juice, honey, um, ginger, which we've got, water, and then it's just basically boil it up, mix in all the rest of the stuff, and then add some yeast and leave it. It's a pretty simple recipe, which is lucky, because I've never done this before. It's flying everywhere. <laughs> and that, I would say, is bruised ginger. This is honey that Alex has given me. So hopefully it's going to give it a nice flavour. Never been one for exact guidelines. <laughs> this is a very, very sharp grater. Careful my fingers don't go the same way as the family sable. The yeast. I've got here, it's a brewer's yeast. But I'm going to leave these for a couple of days just to ferment, let the yeast act, and it will start frothing up. So, fingers crossed, it will work. The ginger beer will be ready to drink in about 10 days' time. But the clouds just won't clear. Well, we've got a nice bit of sun here. And we've got some wind as well, so you'd think it was good haymaking weather, but I'm just looking at the cloud formations and it's just starting to break up into a, what we call a mackerel sky. And the old rhyme goes, mackerel sky, mackerel sky, never long wet, never long dry. And that's not good haymaking weather, so I think we're going to have to leave it for another couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> it's Midsummer's Eve, a night that in Victorian rural folklore held powerful meaning. 
of an evening like this. In the 1880s, um, young women working on farms often liked to sort of use a whole range of folklore practices to work out who they were going to marry. Who were the young men who would uh, strike lucky? <laughs> Many of these rituals took place in churchyards at night. Ruth's daughter Catherine has decided to try one out. Oh, there are so many thorns, it really hurt. <laughs> Can you see? Yeah. Okay, there we go. She's got to scatter hemp seed. Can you remember what I'm supposed to say? Hemp seed, I sow. Hemp, hemp seed should, should grow. grow. <laughs> um, he who will marry me. Come after and mow. Oh, there we go, there we go. Right. I can't remember that, but fine. Okay, ready? Okay, ready. Go on then. Um, hemp seed I sow, hemp seed will grow. Uh, he who will marry me, um, come after and mow. There we go. What's supposed to happen now? He's supposed to appear like a guest. I guess. don't think it's worked. Which um, young man had you in mind? No one. <laughs> <laughs> really? Really, no one really, at all. Really, no one at all. No one at all. No, one at all. no little perspective, um... No, no, not at all. Not in the slightest. Well, you might dream him, you know. Might come as an apparition in your dreams. That's even more creepy, OK? <laughs> I just have to say, that is hugely creepy. <laughs> Back at the farm, the cheese has been pressed. While the unsettled weather continues, the team are taking a trip to explore one final piece of Victorian dairy technology. Oh, doesn't that look magnificent? That is the future, Ruth. It is the future. It is the future. From the 1840s onwards, the railways opened up a crucial new market for dairy farmers. For the first time ever, fresh milk could be sent in bulk from the countryside to the town. Beautiful. Oh, and the carriages too. Look at that. Right, and this is where our milk goes. Right, OK. Oh, to get a flavour of this breakthrough, the teams come to the Tallyflynn Railway in Wales, one of the few railways still preserved as it was in the 19th century. OK. <sighs> Should we ride? Yeah, let's go on for a ride. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm so looking forward to this. Well, I'll see you at the next station. Are you, you going... Green flag. All right, we'll go. Alex is travelling with one of Tally Flynn's most dedicated drivers, Phil Higginson. Well, this is the way to travel. It's got all its original locomotives and rolling stock. Right. So we're on an original train. I mean, so we're, we're on a, a time capsule from the 1860s. Completely. And you think about it, I mean, these engines have gone back and forth on this bit of line since 1865. Imagine it back in the 1860s when this was the cutting edge of, you know, of engineering. This was high tech. This was like when the internet arrived, and broadband at your house. Yeah. I mean. This is the most fantastic train, isn't it? It is indeed, yes. <laughs> If you think about the development in the railways within Queen Victoria's lifetime, in 1830, the speed world record for a steam train is 30 miles an hour. Yeah. In 1895, it's 90 miles an hour. And Bomb. so much more network than there is nowadays in modern Britain. I mean, it's something yeah. like four times as many stations in 1880 yeah. as there are in the 21st century. By these things, they absolutely revolutionise dairy farming. The whole production of raw milk going into cities and towns where before it would have gone off before you got there. But yeah. now, you know, you can get your churns to a station. Yeah, and it's away. Away, quickly. off you go, quickly. Yeah. Arrives in a brilliant state, sellable, straight well, off. The rocking might turn into butter. <laughs> Back on the farm, the weather is worse than ever, and the hay is now in real jeopardy. Fresh grass is growing up underneath the hay crop, making a thick layer 
that would be difficult for Victorian machines to cut. In a brief gap in the rain, the boys have decided it's now or never for the hay harvest. They've called in expert local horseman Brian Davis to help. It's not cutting, is it? No, it's not. It's so thick, isn't it? Yeah. Try it again, Brian. <laughs> Keep up, come on. Keep up. I'm really feeling for Alex at the moment. He was so up for this. He's put so much effort into it, and it's just not working. It's so thick and so wet as well. It's almost it's like soapy. It's what's called soapy. It's. Look at that. I mean, look, you, Peter's wringing it out there. Look at that, wringing it out. To become hay, the grass must be able to dry in the field. But this grass is so wet, it's more likely to rot away instead. It's like a carpet, isn't it? Shag park. For a Victorian farmer, this would have been disastrous. A failed hay crop would leave him with nothing to feed his animals over winter. So the boys aren't quitting. Give it a few more tries, maybe, Brian. Back. 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 Uh, but eventually, they come to a painful decision. I'm afraid we've had to give up. It's just too thick, this crop. It's too wet. And we've had to admit defeat. In this situation, the Victorian farmer would have had to buy in his hay for the coming months. That would mean raising money from elsewhere on the farm. So everything now rests on the success of the team's wheat field. They need a bumper and profitable crop when they harvest it in a few weeks' time. Bloody rain. Rain, 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 rain. Let's hope it doesn't affect the wheat, eh? Yeah, there's more clouds in the horizon, isn't there? Every cloud has a silver lining. Just got to work out what it is. <laughs> Hopefully it'll be your ginger beer, my good friend. <laughs> Hi, Ruth. Hello. Oh, gosh. You're back quick. We are. Sadly, it's not to be. Yeah, it's not to be, unfortunately. Not today and probably not ever. Really? It's not this year, anyway, for us. Just too wet and, you too know, thick. thick. Too thick. Oh, what a shame. No, a bit it sad. is a shame. It's a shame, because I was really looking forward to doing it. Well, we've still got all this ginger beer of yours. Well, should we give it a go? It looks the part. It really does. Well, here's to a better wheat harvest, eh? Yeah. Yes, here's to a better wheat harvest. Mmm, that's gorgeous. It's not bad, is it? That is delicious. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. I don't, I don't like ginger beer, that's but that really is nice. good. Something's gone right. <laughs> <laughs> thank goodness, thank goodness. What are we going to do if the wheat doesn't work? No, it oh. will, it will. It will work. We'll <laughs> make it work. Then. Yeah. We've got to. We've got to. Next time on Victorian Farm, the year-long project nears its end. But first, the team face their toughest challenge, the wheat harvest. <laughs> there are urgent repairs to be made. Water. <laughs> yeah, right. Cutting-edge technology, Victorian style. Yes. Oh, no. Oh, no. And, crucially, they need dry weather. Otherwise, a year's work will have been in vain. <laughs> <laughs>